The concept of holy water was first introduced around the year 400 in the extra-biblical text, the Apostolic Constitutions. It's attributed to either Matthew, writer of the Book of Matthew, or Matthias, the disciple who replaced Judas. Uh, nobody really knows for sure because they have the same name in Greek. But it really doesn't matter as many scholars doubt the authenticity of the text anyway. But that hasn't stopped holy water from being used in various churches and ministries throughout the centuries. People claim that it can do everything from heal you to make you receive checks in the mail. A sort of a spiritual Swiss army knife, if you will. But what does this have to do with a worship song? Let's find out together. Hi, I'm Eric Rock, and this is Worship Song Lyric Analysis. For those of you who don't know, in this series we walk through worship songs, both old and new, and figure out A, exactly what they mean, and more importantly, B, are they biblical? Today, we're going to be looking at a newer song, Holy Water by We the Kingdom. We the Kingdom's most notable member is Ed Cash, a famous songwriter and music producer, especially of Christian music. Probably his most famous songwriting and producing credit is Chris Tomlin's How Great Is Our God. Holy Water was written by all five members of We the Kingdom together, and Cash has described in interviews how the concept just came to them as they were working on another song. He says that they kind of got lost in the song and that it just kind of flowed out of them and the whole song was written in about three days. The band has described it as talking about their respective spiritual journeys, different points that they were on at different times during their spiritual journeys. Also, despite the song being called Holy Water, which is usually associated with Catholicism, I can't find any mention of Cash being Catholic or raised Catholic or exactly what his affiliation is or what he believes about holy water itself. This lack of information about Cash's beliefs could be in part because several years ago Christianity Today published an article investigating a group that Cash was involved in called the Gathering International. They claimed that it was a cult and that Cash's revenue from his music production and co-writing were helping fund it. I mean, it only claimed things like all churches with elder boards are controlled by demons, so probably a good thing it was outed, but still. Anyway, soon after, Cash cut ties with the group and with its leader, Wayne Jolly. And this is just my personal theory, but... I think that embarrassment from that may be a contributing factor in why Cash doesn't want his personal beliefs scrutinized too hard anymore. Not that I think he's involved in anything shady or anything. But long story short, I legitimately don't know if they're taking holy water in a literal or figurative sense in this song. Spoilers, it doesn't change much of the meaning though. But without further ado, let's see what the song says. The song starts off in verse 1. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging please again. And as we've talked about a few times in this series, being on your knees represents prayer. They're praying to God. Uh, this happens several times throughout the scriptures, where people kneel down to pray to God. In fact, Jesus himself, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, kneels down to pray to God. In ancient cultures, kneeling before someone was a sign of reverence and respect. And I personally believe that your position when you pray does not matter so much as your heart. So what are they praying about? The song continues, I need you. Oh God, I need you. And yes, we all need God. This is a very important thing to acknowledge. In Acts 17.28, Paul says, In him we live and move and have our being. So yes, we need God all the time. In fact, this God I need you part is kind of a repeating pattern. 
that they use at the end of every stanza of the verse. Which is cool, it's a little acknowledgement that no matter what season they're on, in their journey, they need God. The song goes on. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. Okay, if you're not familiar with worship songs, that may seem a little confusing. But if you are, you're quite familiar with the fact that water in modern worship songs very often represents God or Jesus or being close to God. And by extension, being in a desert where there's no water represents being far from God. This analogy itself is not unbiblical at all. David uses it in Psalm 42 to compare his longing for God to a deer longing for water. Jesus himself in John 4 says that he is the living water that people can drink to never be thirsty again. So just the comparison itself is biblical. Many people take issue with modern worship songs that go overboard with this analogy. You can be the judge for yourself on this one if it's too much. I personally don't think it's too bad as there's only one analogy and it is in the context of a journey because at this point in their journey, they are far from God. Okay, so in the story, we have them down on their knees, praying, acknowledging to God, I've been far from you. I need the living water. I need you. Oh God, I need you. And what do they find? God's forgiveness. That's when we get to the chorus. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony in my ears. Like holy water on my skin. And yeah, it paints a very poetic picture of what God's forgiveness is like because when you fully feel God's forgiveness, it is an amazing thing. Full disclosure, I actually enjoy jamming out to this chorus just because of that fact. However, we do have to talk about that line, holy water. Most churches that use holy water believe that it has properties to remove ritual or moral uncleanliness, which is interesting because that's exactly what God's forgiveness does to us. So here in the song, they're saying that God's forgiveness is like the ultimate holy water, which is true. Whatever people think that holy water does, God's forgiveness is what actually does it for them. And saying that God's forgiveness works like holy water functions this way whether or not they believe in the power of holy water, which is why it's not super important in the grand scheme of understanding what the song says. However, while we're talking about holy water, I do need to make three points. Number one, I am thoroughly convinced from scripture that holy water without God's power and forgiveness is worthless. It is no better than water from a faucet at home. And whatever you do, do not buy holy water from a TV ad. It's a scam and you're funding false teachers. Point number two. I don't believe that God usually works through the holy water in most churches today. I believe most churches use them due to the ritual or that's the way they've always done it. I'm not saying that God could not work through a holy water in a church given the right circumstances, but I don't believe that that's his usual way of working today. Point number three. If you truly believe that God's power and God's forgiveness are what is working through the holy water in your church, I'm not going to sit here without knowing your situation and say that you're wrong or a heretic because of this difference in our theology. I would encourage you, and in fact, I'd encourage you whether you believe in holy water or not, to search the scriptures and see what God is saying about this topic. Okay, but anyway, story-wise, they've been in a far place from God, they really need God, and now they've finally found God's forgiveness. What happens next? Let's find out right after we learn some Hebrew! Hello! 
and welcome back to the best mid-segment ever created, Learning the Original Languages with Eric, where we learn Hebrew or Greek one word at a time. As main segment Eric already spoiled, <clears throat> not that I'm bitter, <clears throat> today we will be learning a Hebrew word, specifically Kadosh, which is translated holy or sacred. While today most people think of the word holy as meaning perfect or without sin, in the original Old Testament usage it actually meant more like set apart or different. So when God set aside Israel as a holy nation, they were a nation set apart from others at the time. Or in Isaiah 6, when the angels surround the throne singing holy, 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 that threefold repetition represents the fact that God is so different from us that it can be hard for us to comprehend. But believer, know that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and repent of your sin, you are holy as God is holy. It's not a distinction only for saints or people who live perfect lives. We don't need water to be holy. We are holy. Let's thank God for that fact today. This has been Learning the Original Languages with Eric. Now, back to your regularly scheduled programming. Welcome back! Now, where were we? Oh, right. The story. So, they were on their knees, praying to God. They've been in a far place from God and need to get back to God. And they've finally found God's sweet, sweet forgiveness. The song continues in the next verse. Dead man walking, slave to sin. Alright, in Ephesians 2.1, Paul says in no uncertain terms, you were dead in your sins before you found Christ. We have no hope apart from the forgiveness that Christ brings to us. We are slaves to sin. We cannot help but sin without Christ. I want to know about being born again. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you probably just say, born again Christian, like it's nothing. But if you don't know what it means, it is a little weird, right? You'd probably have the same thought as Nicodemus when Jesus first told him. How can a man be born a second time? That's just weird. But here's the deal. When we repent and turn our lives to Christ and accept his gracious forgiveness, we are made new. We are completely different. Whereas before, we could not help but sin, now, in Christ, we are free to not sin. And there should be such a radical change because of Christ's power and the Holy Spirit in us that it's almost like we are a brand new person. So, we were born once into sin, but then born again a second time into righteousness. So that's what Jesus is referring to when he says, you must be born again in John 3. So this part of the journey represents when they were far from God, when they didn't know God, and they experienced that forgiveness for the very first time. Isn't that amazing? So take me to the riverside, take me under, baptize. Okay. Sort of a mini controversy here again, because some churches believe that you must be baptized to be saved, and I don't know if that's what they believe or not. And I'm not going to get too much into this topic, I'll leave some resources down in the description for further reading, but long story short, some people do think that it saves you, but there are enough places in the scripture where it says you just need to believe that I don't believe that baptism is at all necessary for salvation. Baptism is simply a picture, a public identification that you now belong to Christ. So story-wise, they are so sold out for Christ that they want to be publicly identified as being followers of Christ. 
Okay, so now we get to the bridge, which says, I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. They've talked about how this was part of the inspiration for the song, was this forgiveness is so amazing and so sweet, they don't want to abuse it. In Romans 6, Paul talks about, well, if God's grace is so good, shouldn't we keep sinning so that we receive more grace? And obviously the answer is no, we should not keep sinning because that's abusing God's grace. The song goes on, it's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. And Paul continues in Romans 6, we died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? If we truly understand the greatness of God's forgiveness and his grace, we will not want to sin, we will want to change, we will want to become more like Christ. If we don't want to change, if we just want to keep sinning over and over, that represents an improper understanding of God's grace. We are literally abusing God's grace, which obviously we wouldn't want to do if we have a relationship with Christ. That would be like abusing someone you love. Story-wise, they've found God's sweet, sweet forgiveness, and now they're in a relationship with Christ and don't want to abuse it. They want to experience it for what it is. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Okay, that was Holy Water by We the Kingdom. What I really love about it is that it tells a story about different points in the journey of life. So many worship songs today just talk about one point in your life. I love that it paints an amazing picture of God's forgiveness. And honestly, I love that it kind of rocks. It has a kind of folksy style, uh, reminiscent of Ren Collective, that's different from most other worship songs nowadays. However, if you sing this song for worship, either for yourself or with your church, I'd encourage you to examine how you're singing it. If you don't believe in the power of holy water, are you saying that you do by singing this song? If you do believe in the power of holy water, do you believe that God's love and grace and forgiveness are the actual forces behind it? Or do you believe that the water itself has some kind of mythical or magical power? I'd encourage you to examine your hearts on this issue. If you don't want to sing this song because you don't want to be associated with the improper theology that often surrounds holy water, I respect that too. You do what feels right to you based on your understanding of the scriptures. I hope after watching this, you feel like you know a little more about the song Holy Water and how biblical it is. May God bless you and keep you as you serve and worship him today and every day. Peace.